everyone. Welcome. I wasn't sure if we'd get any turnout at all, to be given the date, but thank you all for coming. Um, we hold, the Chittenden Downey Historical Society holds talks every other month during what, would be, what I would call the school year primarily, and we have an annual meeting in July. If you're interested in finding out if you're, if you're not members and would like to join, you can uh, find us at uh, cchsvt.org. If you forget to put in the VT, you go to the Humane Society. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about this presentation. And um, my name is Carolyn Gould. I'm president of this organization. And um, we have some of the board members here today who I think a lot of you know because I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Um, but one thing I'd like to point out for those of you who don't know us is that we are an entirely content-driven organization. That means we publish articles, we publish books, and we hold presentations on topics that are broadly defined as historic. And to me, that means history of the land, history of the people who interacted with the land, history of manufacturing, history of art and architecture. It's a broad combination broad definition as opposed to revolutionary war heroes. <laughs> so I think it's an important distinction that you make because for someone who sees the world interacting in various ways, that the, the dwellings that we make reflect the grounds we live on. So you see housing change according to where it is in the United States. And having grown up in Oregon, natives in where I grew up in the valley used cedar because it was, rain would not penetrate it because of the oils in the cedar. So we're gonna hear a lot about the connection of timber to land, I'm sure. Um, so I am so delighted to have these two <coughs> as our speakers today because it combines two of my greatest passions, historic preservation and conservation. And you can't find a more fascinating organization than this, the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, and the project that, we're, um, that they're working on. Um, one of the speakers, Elliot Lothrop, is the recipient of our 2324 um, research grant to do research on Charles Miller, who is a barn architect. And I know I was as blown away as you were to hear barn architect because we think of barns being raised by communities not being given an architect or let alone knowing the name of that architect. And so the barn that they're working on is the East Monitor Barn in Richmond. And I'm sure we're gonna hear about that as well, right? Um, I just have to say that if I were between the ages of 15 and 25, I would be applying to be in this program. No question about it. I mean, it's so exciting. Um, and I'm sure they're gonna tell you a lot about the history of the, this um, organization. And plus, I think Breck has some numbers that are absolutely mind boggling about the impact they have. And if you're involved in any of the not-for-profits in these areas, somebody from, it, who went through the programs at UVM in, um, as a field naturalist or as a, in historic preservation, they, their mark is someplace in the past few years. Anyway, so first of all, some very brief intros. Brett Knopf, who's here, um, started out in a career as a teacher and administrator and working in secondary and post-secondary education. He uh, went to Hobart, I think. Lawrence. 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 And uh, you went to Hobart. Um, and came to um, he, here, probably because you went to St. Michael's, right? Grad school. Grad school. So he is the um, president of the organization, but he started out there in 2008. What did you start out as? and became its uh, 
ED, executive director, in 2015. Elliot, who knows some of you because we've worked together, um, is a principal of Building Heritage, which is his own company. Uh, he specializes in timber repairs of historic buildings. And if any of you have lived in an old house or had an old barn or whatever, you know that, that it requires an, a background that's special, not only because of the tension on the framing, the wood, whether it's rotted or strong, how big the pillars are, all of that plays a role in that kind, these kinds of old structures. Um, he uh, founded his company after having worked in, on the field a lot in 2004, right? So his company's named Building Heritage. I don't know if you can see in the orange on the screen, but it has their websites as well. So without any more blithering on my part, I introduce you to Greg Knopf. Thank you. Well, thank you for that nice introduction and uh, I would just extend appreciation to everyone for coming out on the Sunday before the holidays. It's a busy time of year. Uh, Elliot and I are excited to share a little bit about BYCC and the restoration of the East Monitor Barn. We have really um, a slideshow that's in two parts. Uh, I'll start by talking about BYCC, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, and then we'll pivot and have a real greater focus on the restoration of the East Monitor Barn. And because this is uh, an invitation to come and talk with the Historical Society, um, it's a, my, my uh, remarks about VYCC are at once looking backwards and, and trying to explain and give an overview of the roots of the organization, as well as a snapshot of programs today and where we want to take, take the organization. I'll also share that Elliot and I have collaborated a lot this year in the restoration of the barn uh, and all the moving pieces there, programmatic, financial, preservation, engineering, um, lots of moving parts. And we've talked about, uh, wouldn't it be great if we can go and um, go on a little bit of a speaking tour? Wouldn't it be great and go and talk to folks and really generate excitement and enthusiasm and appreciation for what we're doing? This is our first time doing that. So I don't know if we're workshopping this for the big leagues, <laughs> uh, or if this is the big leagues, and we just jumped right in. But either way, it's really nice to have the invitation. So thank you for that. Um, I'll start with um, grounding us, I think, and sharing that conservation course today and VYCC is really what we think of as a living legacy of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And Civilian Conservation Corps um, I'm sure everyone knows, was created by uh, President Roosevelt, um, FDR, uh, in the height of the Depression, for over three million um, young men, mostly men, mostly white men, who were in the CCV, CCC. CCC. Um, and this, I don't know if everyone can read this, this um, quote comes from FDR, and I'll read it. Uh, and it, this is what he had in mind when creating the Civilian Conservation Corps. He said, I propose to create a civilian conservation corps to be used in simple work. More important, however, than the material gains will be the moral and spiritual value of, this, of such work. Uh, and we don't necessarily talk today about BYCC in spiritual or moral terms, uh, but the point there is that it's both infrastructure that's that will be addressed and built, as well as in a really enormously empowering uh, employment experience for young people. And it's that combination of investing in people and investing in infrastructure that I think is where you really see the power and the magic uh, of the CCC, but also uh, organizations like BYCC. Um, so, Elliot, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, the, uh, oh, sorry, there's a typo here. I'm already correcting myself. It's 90 years, not 100 years. Uh, so my math was wrong. But the um, Civilian Conservation Corps was actually started in March of um, 33. And here we are 90 years later. And what I like about this picture on the left, it's from Brattleboro. So that's in 
uh, in Vermont. I don't know what the project was. I don't know if there was a camp down there. The caption said Brattleboro 1933. Um, and you can see how, pun intended here, the esprit de corps is really similar between what was happening there and what's happening here. Because this picture uh, on the right is from Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Park, just down the road from, or up the road from, um, from Brattleboro. Uh, and again, you have folks taking a break, really excited and proud about the project. Um, it's all very hands-on. This is the work that our crews are doing, and it's really comparable to the work of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, okay, Elliot, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, VYCC started in 1985, and one of the things that I learned in coming into this role was that federal programs, the, the, the Civilian Conservation Corps morphed into other types of federal programs that went into the late 70s and the early 80s. And then when President Reagan was elected, and it was an era of smaller government, a lot of those federal programs went away. But the, the states saw that these cores were really dynamic, effective, worthwhile institutions, programs, organizations. And so you have really the emergence of smaller statewide, sometimes regional conservation cores that came about in the 80s. And BYCC was very much part of that trend. So we started in 1985. Um, and this is our very first crew over here on the left. Um, and then this is a crew from this year. So again, you see the bookending of the experience in our early days uh, to what the experience can look like, feel like now. Um, this is a crew that's working on the Burroughs Trail uh, on the way up to Camel Sump, putting in some stone steps. Um, really from the beginning, we have been embraced by, I would say the whole state of Vermont, uh, more specifically the legislature of Vermont. We were um, uh, included in statute in 1985, created with a $1 appropriation, and have built it from that $1 appropriation. Uh, that the, uh, the, there's a technical reason as well as a practical reasons for the $1 appropriation. By giving, having a state give VYCC $1 at the start, it set a precedent for state funding and support of the organization. Um, and that's because we do so much work on state land that it makes sense for the state to be investing in infrastructure in a way that also supports workforce development. Here you see Governor Coonan um, and both of these pictures. You can also see uh, my predecessor, Tom Hark, who was our first uh, leader of the organization and really deserved an enormous amount of credit for building something that um, we're hoping to carry forward. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. Yep. Um, for the first seven years, BYCC was actually not an independent 501c3. We weren't our own nonprofit. We were part of state government. Um, the initial statutory language has us being part of the Agency of Natural Resources as well as what was then called Department of Education and Training, which is now the Department of Labor. Um, we really work most closely within Agency of Natural Resources, and even more specifically, Forest Parks and Recreation. And as part of that, we were running state parks, doing a lot of work on state land. And then in the early 90s, 1992, we really realized we could keep this great, dynamic, effective partnership in place with the state, but we could be a little more nimble and we'd be able to raise more private funds if we became an independent 501c3. So we transitioned to being a nonprofit in the early 90s and have been um, ever since. Next slide. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm going to fast forward. This is the moment in the movie where uh, Wizard of Oz, where it goes from black and white to color. Um, and, uh, so we're, we're in modern times here. Um, both uh, these pictures are actually taken on our campus in Richmond. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone knows this, we have a 400 acre campus right along Route 2 in Richmond. It's where the two monitor barns are. We moved there in 2005 um, and then in 2008 purchased what we think of as our East Campus, which is the East Monitor Barn. And here we are now, 15 years after that second purchase, uh, restoring the East Barn in LA. We'll talk about that. One thing I want to point out, um, this is our current mission, take action and build community by working and learning together with the land. Um, a couple years ago, we went through a really awesome, 
uh, community conversation to take a hard look at um, what is really at the core of the core. And part of that process, we spent a lot of time talking with young people. And young people, they really want to take action. They spend a lot of their um, time in classrooms. And when it comes to actually um, public service, they want to roll up their sleeves, they want to get their hands in the dirt, they want to do things. Um, and they want to be part of something that's a little larger than themselves. So those first five words, take action, build community, are really the spirit of the mission. And then um, this last piece is the second half of it, if you will, working and learning together with the land is a little bit of how we do and what we do. So, uh, two main programs, we have a food and farm program and then a conservation program, and I'll get into those in a bit more detail on there. Okay, Ellie, right. um, You can see that we continue to work uh, in state parks. Um, Carolyn, I was really appreciative of you uh, hyping the impact that we have. Uh, it's hype that actually is grounded and it's, it's well deserved. Um, you can see just um, this one crew that was working at Brighton and Stillwater State Parks. Um, I just want, I'm not a huge fan of folks who like put up a slide and then read it, but I'm not sure if everyone can read it in the back. So 1,300 square foot boardwalk replaced, demolished and rebuilt two viewing platforms. 1,600 square feet of buildings painted, painted, 100 square feet of roof reshingled, two life jacket racks constructed, 1,300 feet of trail maintained, 256 square feet of rot repair. So crews get a lot done. Um, there's a real focus on supporting members, but there's also a focus on productivity. Um, it is a job, there are high expectations. Um, it's a paid service experience. Um, and part of what we're doing is we're helping a young adult. For many folks, it's their first job, and this is what the workplace is like. And so there's the technical skills of how to make a building straight and true and plumb and everything square and put together in a way that lasts. But there's also um, what are sometimes called soft skills or now referred to as durable skills of actually being able to show up at the work site and work alongside folks who might be different than you, take care of yourself and come back day after day be a contributing member of the team. Um, okay, next slide here, Elliot. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit over the next few slides about what the projects are. Um, but before I do that, let me just zoom out a little bit and say that in any given year, VYCC will offer paid service positions to about 175 young adults. It's a mix of high school students, folks who are in college, folks who've graduated or maybe haven't gone to college. Almost all of our participants are from Vermont, but others come from across the country to hopefully put down roots and stay here in Vermont. We need to figure out our housing, housing situation, but <laughs> lots of other good folks working on that. Um, and they work in small teams. And each team will have one or two leaders and then about four to six members. So you have two crew leaders, handful of core members, crew members, and then that crew is assigned projects, and sometimes they'll be on that project for a month at a time, other times they're a week at a time, and then they ro rove around to other parts of Vermont. We have projects that are on our campus, and then we have projects in Pownall, and we have projects in Newport, and everywhere in between. So we're very much a statewide organization, um, nearly 200 core members, completing about 70,000 hours of service work in any given year. Um, and within that broad framework, there's different project initiatives, one of which is water quality. So if you think about water quality, we all want a lake that we can swim in, enjoy, and fish out of. Um, water quality takes on a few different forms. You can see someone here planting trees. Um, it looks like a uh, core member in the middle is pulling invasive species, doing probably the same on the left. We also do it's called GSI, green stormwater infrastructure, rain gardens, things of that sort. Um, uh, and um, this is a dream job. You get to go out kayak on the lake uh, all summer long. So um, that's what Elliot and I are shooting for next. All right, <laughs> Elliot, you wanna go to the next slide? So in addition to water quality, um, trail work, of course, uh, that's a bit of our bread and butter. Last year, I think we did 52 crew weeks of trail work, um, roughly, I think we did 80 miles of trail maintenance for uh, restoration. Um, 
and you can see that it's both, um, you know, it's both digging in the dirt um, as well as some technical aspects here of actually building a boardwalk. Uh, it's really fun when, um, when the community comes out and it actually sees the crew on the trail. Um, it can be a little disruptive if everyone's giving us high fives and interrupting us all the time, but that's the way interruption we won't take. Um, all right, what's next? Forestry work. Forestry is, is a relatively new initiative for us. Um, what we're seeing in, in that kind of, um, uh, within that initiative is that there's a niche and a place for VYCC. You have uh, foresters, foresters who really, professional foresters who want to take out larger timbers and might go in there with a skid steer. That's not work that we're doing. Instead, what we're doing is a lot of wildlife habitat management, um, also invasive work. So for example, there might be an old historic apple orchard where a lot of vegetation, small trees have grown up around the apples apple trees, and we can go in there and take all of that out and release those trees. It's good for um, forest itself, it's good for wildlife. Um, and we're doing more and more work with um, not just federal and state partners, but even some um, private individuals who have conservation easements on their land. I think next, last, two years ago, we had six crew weeks, next year we're gonna have 36 weeks. So it's really uh, fun to see the trajectory of that. All right, I'm moving towards the end of my time. Um, I did want to make the note that we have different levels of experience within the organization. So we don't have high school students with chainsaws. Um, <laughs> um, I do think that's funny. Uh, we, do have, uh, we do have high school experiences for folks. We have AmeriCorps experiences and we have our more advanced or pro crews. Um, and so um, chainsawing is something that you'll have on our AmeriCorps or our, what we call our pro or advanced crews. Um, uh, this past year we did 26 weeks again next year we'll do more um, you can see that there's a whole series of credentials that people get it's called game of logging there's different levels game of logging one two three and it's a technical type of course you take in order to not just be safe but be more ergonomically efficient and um, and use the saw in a way that really uh, is different than just a regular um, pull saw um, and then other, we try to layer in other credentials um, uh, along the way. Okay, Elliot, next slide. Um, this is a fun initiative as well. Our carpentry crews, our build crews, a lot of infrastructure work happens in state parks. Um, this middle uh, picture here is a picture of uh, the hut that we built for the Vermont Huts Association down in Grout Pond. To call it a hut is really underselling it. It's really a it's really smartly designed uh, four season small house, um, but that you can't have an organization called the Vermont Smartly Designed Four Season <laughs> Small House Association. So, uh, so it's called a hut, um, and uh, it's it's particularly awesome when you have folks who really didn't think of themselves as carpenters, uh, and then with training and support. Um, you put uh, a power tool or even just a hammer in their hands and a whole new world opens up. Um, and we see that time and time again. It's particularly true with young women and I uh, just love that part of the, uh, the program. Um, next, Elliot. Um, okay, so I've just been talking about the conservation side of the house, if you will. We have a working farm uh, on our campus um, and Vermont is this great ecosystem for food systems and agricultural innovation, collaboration, um, and VYCC is really part of that. So just as a conservation crew project benefits the greater good, so does the farm. So the farm's project that is benefiting the greater good is called the health care share. So our core members are growing food. That's then we work with medical centers or partners who identify families who have struggled with food insecurity or diet-related illness, and then they'll get a weekly healthcare share. It's uh, one of Vermont's largest CSA-type programs. Uh, this past year, there was about 425 uh, families who were enrolled through different medical centers across the state. Um, and you kind of think, only in Vermont, and let's have more of that uh, in Vermont. Um, and so here you see on the left, core members 
uh, bagging up groceries, harvest, if you will, from the farm at BYCC. Um, and uh, it's a lot of fun hanging out with chickens, too. I think that's the point there. Um, what's next, Elliot? Um, yeah, so at, at risk of stating the obvious, you saw young adults in all these pictures being part of something that's larger than themselves. And uh, to be a catalyst for that personal growth, workforce development, a sense of belonging, a sense of connection to the state, um, and feel like um, they are contributing in ways that are meaningful, that, that is a strategy for wellness and resiliency. As much as it's a strategy for infrastructure and as much as it's a strategy for economic development. Um, and what's really fun is about the way that BYC is really, that BYCC is at the center um, of those different outcomes. Um, and uh, if you come to the barn, open invitation to come to both the West and East Monitor Barn and the restored West Monitor Barn, all the hallways and rooms are lined with all these pictures that really just scratch the surface. It's pretty fun and inspiring to walk around and see all the pictures. Um, and check out these sunglasses. <laughs> All right, uh, Elliot, I think we're wrapping up here. Um, yeah, this is the beginning of a segue to Elliot. What, one thing that we're trying to do as an organization, we start with the premise that the core experience is really awesome. It's good for a community, it's good for a group, it's good for a young person. So how can we find ways to bring more young people into the organization? And we looked at some of the barriers to participation and it's some of the obvious things like transportation, um, compensation, and, and we're working on addressing all of those. But another big one is housing and accommodation. So we have an AmeriCorps program, which is, helps underwrite the cost uh, and supports the learning outcomes. And each AmeriCorps member gets a modest stipend, but that modest stipend is not enough to pay for an apartment on the open market. So what we're trying to do is build infrastructure so that we can actually have more of them folks who are actually staying on our <coughs> campus. And so the restoration of the East Barn in a broader sense is part of BYCC strategy to build increased accommodation on our campus. Um, and it's not just, uh, and so it's a two-pronged, one is uh, initiative, one is through investment in infrastructure, but then the other is making sure that we're able to support members and compensate them in ever stronger ways um, as, as time moves forward. So for example, if you're, a, well, here's an example of what support looks like. If you are working really hard during the week on a crew and you're sleeping in a tent and it's rainy and it's buggy, when you come back to BYCC on the weekend, you should be able to sleep in a bed. Um, and right now we don't have the capacity to do that. And we're in this quiet stage of a campaign in order to um, make sure that we can do that. Um, I think this is my last slide. Um, oh no, I've got a couple more, uh, but I'll be quick. Just quickly, VYCC is part of one of many cores across the country. Um, in this sense, it's not just an organization, but really part of a larger movement. Next slide. Um, we also have a web of partnerships here in Vermont. Uh, VYCC started a, a coalition called Serve, Learn, Earn um, with different nonprofits here. And each of these nonprofits, Audubon and Vermont Works for Women, or Resource, have different missions, work with different groups of people, but there's a through line where we offer paid service and training experiences. Um, and, um, and this is our collective impact, the serve learner impact, impact um, over the last few years. And you can see 1,000 participants, almost 10,000 weeks of training, um, nearly $2.7 million in wages directly to our participants. So you know, collectively, we're a real economic engine. Really excited in this next year, we're gonna be also including Northwood Stewardship Center. They're in the Northeast Kingdom, because you can see there's a little bit of hole there. I really wanna be uh, covering all parts of the state. Um, you can go two slides forward, Elliot. Um, and this is um, not our first rodeo, so we're restoring the East Barn. Um, this is a picture of both barns along with the farmhouse um, before the West Barn, which is this barn, was restored. And we're enormously proud to be stewards and the folks who are restoring these barns. Um, this picture was probably taken uh, in the summer of 2005. You can see the vegetation is in, in place, the landscaping is really fresh. Um, 
and uh, and it's very bright red. <laughs> so it's only freshly painted. Um, and uh, the last slide is a really fun one. It's a picture of Dan Lee. So Dan was a crew leader for us for two years back in 2008 and 2009. Uh, first time he was first summer he was down at Quichi State Park, and then he was at the Muslimu Rec area, um, and. Uh, he was doing water quality work, so as part of that water quality work during that time, he had a bundle of willow fascines, uh, which is what he has over uh, his shoulder here. Well, uh, fast forward to today, where Dan is working on Elliot's crew uh, and the restoration of the East Barn. And I think it's, it's just a great feel-good story because Dan's an awesome guy and uh, to have him stay connected to BYCC is really wonderful. But also if you invest, I think, in a young person at a really important time in their life, that investment really just sticks. Uh, and it's, a, it's you see many, many core members who look for ways to keep giving back to Vermont. Um, and um, so you got a picture of Dan there. Um, where he's striking a comparable pose to what he was doing uh, <laughs> in 2008. So um, I've now taken us into the basement, the ground floor of the East Barn, um, which is maybe a good time to hand it off to Elliot. And then we'll do questions at the end. Is that work too, Caroline? Okay, great. Okay, and I can drive the train here. Yeah. Yeah. Hello everybody, I'm Elliot Lothrop from Building Heritage. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about uh, the East Barn and the work that we've been doing this year. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, I did get a grant to research Charles Miller, the builder. He's sort of an architect builder, um, what we would call a master framer. So at that point in time, you would have a timber framer who would come in and lay out all the timbers um, for other folks to cut, but they would have a really good understanding of geometry, uh, engineering, and how to raise a four-story uh, 54 by 112 foot uh, structure. Um, and uh, so we'll do a, another presentation, hopefully in the future, more about Charles Miller, uh, the design of the building and, uh, and other buildings uh, around Chittenden and Addison County that Charles Miller, focusing mostly on Chittenden County, um, that Charles Miller built. Um, but this is the East Monitor Barn. Uh, it's super impressive structure, one of the largest barns in the state, uh, four stories tall, it's a bank barn. And so it's accessible uh, by horses in this case uh, for, for uh, machinery operation, uh, horses driving it uh, from every level. So you could come in at the basement uh, where you'd pull your manure out. Well, actually I'll, I'll reverse and start from the top down. Um, you would bring your hay in at the top level here. You can just see, just barely see, the only photo we really have is a high drive here. So there's a stone above and with a wooden ramp that would take you into the high drive level of the barn. Um, so you'd have a hay wagon with loose hay, uh, driven in this case by horses, um, and you would bring your, your, your hay wagon into the barn and you'd be pitching loose hay with a pitchfork over uh, sort of a parapet wall. Um, so you're going down this thing that's a catwalk and on either side of you, it's, it's 12 feet wide. Um, you've got a parapet wall and you're throwing the hay over. And then this entire space here, the hay mound below, would be full of hay. Um, there are chutes inside that you'll see later on where you can throw the hay down to the cows below. Uh, the, line, the layer there with the um, level with the, the windows was the stock level where the cows were. And then you could throw the manure down to the basement below where you'd have wa uh, sleds that you could drag the manure out on, spread it in the field. Um, built in 1901. And this uh, gravity feed bank barn, you know, notion, this is kind of the culmination, the kind of pinnacle of it. This was a notion that the Shakers had sort of started in the mid 19th century um, with Round Barn and, and Hancock Shaker Village. Um, and other, lots of other folks are using this notion, but this is kind of the culmination of it before we get into sort of electrical and more industrial farming. Um, yeah, just a great photo. You can see also all the other great buildings that are in it. Um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, a bunch of other structures. Nothing else is here at this point, uh, other than the small carriage barn that's on the far side of the East Barn. The farmhouse uh, burned in the 80s and is reconstructed on the same foundation, uh, but it's a new structure. All right. Um, so uh, Breck talked a little bit about Dan, uh, Dan Lee, uh, who showed a couple slides ago. Um, his connection to uh, both VYCC and to the barn um, and there's so many levels, layers of, of uh, connection, things coming full circle for so many of us in the project. Um, I myself have a similar one. 
uh, moved up, uh, went to undergrad school for uh, pre-architecture, went to UVM for uh, grad school in historic preservation. I had a dog and was trying to find a place to live in Burlington with a dog, which was nearly impossible. I'm sure it still is. Um, and uh, had this notion that maybe I could find like a little single wide trailer on some farmer's land and I could do 10 hours of work a week in exchange for room and board. Um, seemed like there were a couple things like that, but I couldn't find like a bulletin board that had all the names of those people. Uh, so I was forlorn, I'm driving back to New Hampshire and instead of taking 89, I decided to take Route 2 uh, on a Saturday. And lo and behold, I drive by the Vermont Farm Bureau on a Saturday, happened to stop in and um, the director of the Farm Bureau, uh, Tim Buskey was there, never there on a Saturday, uh, but he happened to be there on a Saturday. I said, hey, do you have a list of farmers? And I, uh, he said, well, no, but we do have this milk house right there and it's gonna be up for rent in August. I said, well, how do you feel about dogs? We love dogs. So for $400 a month, <laughs> I got to live in the little milk house here. Um, the Farm Bureau had converted into an office for them and then uh, I was a second renter. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was wonderful and awful at the same time. There were raccoons uh, living upstairs <laughs> and you turn the oven on and it would smell like mouse pee a half an hour later. Um, but it was just amazing. And uh, another quick little story, I had taken a timber frame course before this uh, in between undergrad and grad school at a place called Hartwood in Western Mass. I was really interested. I knew that I wanted to do this timber framing thing, but I, I was totally green, didn't know what I was doing. And, um, everybody said, well, you get to Vermont, Jan Lewandowski, get in touch with Jan Lewandowski. So I called up Jan Lewandowski, who um, was at this point working on the West Barn or was just about to work in the West Barn. And he said, well, it's funny you should call. I'm gonna be working in Richmond in February on the Monitor Barn. At this point, it's like November. I'm in graduate school for historic preservation. And I said, well, what's a Monitor Barn? And you know what it was. And so he's describing the roof line to me. I said, well, geez, I think I live there. Uh, and so you can just barely see the timber frame from the West Barn is right there. And so I got to work for Jan uh, for a couple months on, on the West Barn. Uh, so yeah, wonderful full circle. Um, and uh, Jan, uh, just amazing. I'm sure most folks know Jan, at least know the name. Um, he's done the Shelburne Farm Breeding Barn, uh, did the West Barn restoration, um, all sorts of great stuff. He did two conditions assessments on the East Barn. Uh, and the thing with the East Barn, so it's, it's a platform frame. So it's basically two timber frames. So the lower box here from this line down is basically one timber frame with plates, posts that go all the way up. And then you've got a cap here and then another timber frame above it. So if you walk in that upper timber frame, it's basically its own giant barn. Um, and there's a hinge point in between the two. And what happened was this foundation on the back side, the hill, the pressure from the hill behind it, pushed that stone wall and it pushed this lower box downhill so that this point here was about a foot further forwards than the foundation was. The upper box went with it, so it was hanging out a foot beyond its foundation and the lower box of leaning. Um, in concept, you think, well, geez, we should pull this thing back to where it used to be, which would be an enormous undertaking. Um, in Jan, one of Jan's conditions assessment, he came up with this great idea makes total sense, um, and maybe I would have gotten there on my own, uh, but it was really nice to read this thing and say, well, that's a great idea, to lift the building up and instead of trying to move it back uphill to move the foundation forwards towards the road. Um, so you can see here the lean uh, in the structure. Um, there's other photos that maybe show it even better, but uh, on the left, I had put some, uh, I, one of the first projects I got to do on my own when I started building Heritage in 2004, was to work for the Farm Bureau to try to just stabilize the thing to keep it standing. Um, so I put some braces in, you can see down below, and some tie rods in the other direction. Um, that kind of held. The other interesting thing that really shows how much force is on the building is there is a stud in the middle of all of the braces. And you can see on the uphill side, just how, how hard the building is leaning against that brace to, to bend it that way. Um, next slide. So one of the things that we've, we've started to do is, is to do these um, sketch up drawings, models of the whole structure, and to try to, especially on a building that's this large with so many individual members, um, to try to identify what's rotted, what needs repair, what needs replacement. Uh, and then we also took that drawing and uh, plugged in the jacking plan into it. And so in order to, to do all this, to, to move the building area, then we had to lift the whole thing up. Uh, and at the same time, we had to replace a bunch of timbers. And so trying to anticipate the sort of chess moves of, all right, well, if this beam needs to get replaced, well, we can't be lifting it here. Um, so this drawing helps us sort of start to identify those various pieces. This is the hay mail upstairs. You can see the two shoots in the foreground here. There's another two in the middle. 
and they're two at the very back. The, up at the monitor, there are um, there is a series of windows and and, uh, and louvers, and so it's two windows, a louver, a window, a louver, um, and so you're getting the monitor provides for both light and ventilation. So you're venting both the hay mow here, and it's also exhausting the stale air from the cows down below up through that monitor. Um, the chutes also have on the back side there are doors. Uh, I think they're like three feet tall, basically. The whole thing is doors on hinges, so no matter what the height of the hay was inside, these are constantly, you're starting with this thing full of hay in the fall, and you're constantly dropping the level of hay down as you're throwing it to the cows. So you have various doors at different heights. You're constantly just standing on top of a pile of hay, pitching it to the cows below. And this is from up above that. Um, it's with a weird wide angle lens. That's why it kind of looks a little curvy. Everything is actually straight there. Um, but this is the high drive. So this is the catwalk that's all pitching through there. Um, that thick. Uh, really neat detail that Charles Miller did on a couple of his barns. The Jubilee Barn in Huntington, the uh, big white uh, barn on the main road. Same detail as this. So you bring your, your horses in uh, with a hay wagon, um, unload your hay, but you don't want to back the horses out with the wagon. That'd be miserable on that, that bridge. Um, so this is actually a turnaround here where they left out a post. And so you can actually turn the, the hay wagon around and go out forwards. Uh, the other, yeah, the barn Jubilee has the, the same detail. And you can see the, the monitor windows and, and uh, vents there. Um, so, because I'm kind of geeky with all this stuff, uh, one, of the, one of the things we got to do uh, is a, a great neighbor uh, to, um, to the property um, that was generous in donating uh, stumpage. So, donating some of the trees uh, for this year's work. They were doing some logging, anyhow. Uh, and so we were able to identify using that drawing that I showed, identify which timbers needed repair or replacement, figure out how many logs that was, and then uh, work with the landowner to say, hey, we need you know, 10, 22 foot logs, eight, 16 foot logs. And then we brought in a wood miser, a portable sawmill to mill up those various logs to the correct dimension for each allocated timber. Um, and I knew we were doing this and I said, well, geez, I, I remember that happening back in early 2000s. And I'm pretty sure I have a photo. And so I, uh, being the geek that I am, we oriented all the logs and the wood miser in the same way that it had been uh, for the West Barn. So there you I go. Like killing envy. Killing envy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is a stock level. So this is where the cows are. Um, and you can see there are there are four lines of cows with stanchions. Um, there are only remnants of stanchions left because we saved everything that was still there. Um, but these stanchions would have uh, would have gone straight down through the length of the building. Uh, and so they're face to face. The cows are the the hay would drop down in front of that uh, the stanchions there. Uh, and then you can see just barely in this photo you can tell this uh, area here where the cows are standing. This is the newer trough right here. This is actually sloped. So the floor joists are higher here, lower there. So everything is pitching towards the manure gutter, um, four lines of that. And so they actually cut all the floor joists are different. You know, they all taper. Um, this notch that sits here on the beam is different heights depending on where it sits. Um, in order to jack the building up, again, we had to lift from up high. So we're lifting from this upper level there. The cribbing towers had to come up through this floor, and so that's why this floor is being removed, um, because it's this big, tall lift. And so in order to start with the cribbing towers, uh, there's, the basement is full of concrete. There's actually three slabs. Um, so you're looking at the most recent, it's probably like a 1960s slab, maybe a 1930s underneath, uh, about a foot of uh, dirt that you're seeing here. And then another foot of dirt below that, and then we got to what we think was the original slab, um, presumably from 1901. We'll see some pictures of that. Uh, but this, the process here is to um, excavate all the slabs, dirt, everything down to the footing height. Uh, you go to the next one. Um, so that when the building is jacked up in the air in these cribbing towers, you're not digging below the height of the cribbing towers and undermining them. So the, the way it's all going to be on these towers that get built here, like Jenga towers, um, but if you then had to dig out everything around it, you'd be undermining. So that's why we start out digging down to that height initially, and then start building towers here. Um, 
So I think there were two or three truckloads, like the one on the left, 4,000 pieces of cribbing. Um, we worked with this great guy, Lou Knopp, out of Middlebury um, to work with us on the jacking. And um, yeah, it was a huge undertaking. Went, went really, really well. Um, so because they are in incredibly tall cribbing towers, there's a lower network of steel I-beams here uh, that are just meant to stitch all of the cribbing towers together. Um, so those are just stiffeners, so you don't have 16 big tall towers that might be wobbling and moving around. Um, and then you have your main beams that go uh, longitudinally there, and then there are picking beams, cross beams that are on top of that. Um, and yeah, so you look more that. So that's them putting in steel I-beams with the crane. And this is, this is what the full pick looked like. Um, so you'll see the photo of the, the west side of the building on the left, photo of the east side of the building on the right, and you can see they're very different setups. Uh, so on the east side of the building, all this additional steel, um, you'll see in a couple pictures, is just to replace what we call the upper sill. So there's a, a horizontal timber at that level that was in need of replacement. Um, so all that additional setup is just to replace that timber. Um, but it was a really cool and worked really well. Um, so you'll see the process coming up here, I think, of, of what that looked like. This is a little bit about uh, uh, the actual jacking. Um, so this is called a unified jacking system. So there is a small, uh, basically like a little Honda um, like lawnmower engine right here uh, that can control the hydraulic pump. And these are all the gauges, um, the hydraulic lines. And those run to these jacks, and so it's, a, it's called a crib jack. So instead of a regular, you know, hand pump hydraulic jack, it's run off this machine, um, and you can basically lift one point, and then it levels, uh, it, it auto levels all of the different hydraulic lines, so you can start to pick up the weight, level everything, and then the entire building then comes up uh, completely level. So they have one of those on each side of the building. Um, so this is this upper sill you can see right here. This is us getting ready to replace it. This is this whole setup here that was necessary uh, to do that. It's basically clasping each post with two steel I-beams, uh, lifting this upper post off of that sill. The sill has a horizontal beam that comes into it this way. You can just see that tenon there, and then there are posts that came up from below. So there's no, that piece has to slide in from the outside without the piece above and below it. Uh, so that's, why that's all necessary. Um, and as this all says here, what we've done here is uh, to excavate the back side of that stone wall before the lift. Um, Bob Neal of Engineering Ventures was our engineer we worked with on this, and he made a good point that if there was this you know, massive amount of earth pressure that had pushed the stone wall, we lifted the building off it, and there's still this pressure behind it, it might then uh, push the wall more. The building may have been acting as a sort of a buttress, sort of diaphragm resisting that push. Um, so we, we excavated halfway down on that back wall before we did the lift. And there's the new sill on the left. Um, yeah, it was two 32 foot long timbers, a 30 foot long timber and a 28 foot long timber. So we had a bunch of the, the wood miser portable sawmill can mill up to 21 feet. And so all the shorter stuff got milled on site. Um, we brought all the medium sized stuff to Fletcher where they can mill up to 28 feet and then um, there's a guy in Huntington, Miles Janess, who can actually mill up to 60 feet. And so we had, I think, four timbers um, that were 32 foot long that got milled in Huntington. Um, so just trying to kind of allocate all the different mills. Uh, there you go. And so in July, um, so that was that last picture was uh, just days before this all happened. We were basically trying to get to a point where we could get this sill in and then remove all the timbers below that. So that entire wall is removed at this point. Uh, and we did this really great uh, community build work workshop with the Timber Framers Guild, um, where we had a week long workshop to uh, teach repair techniques and, um, and actually got into a little bit of reinstallation of all the repaired pieces. Uh, really great collaboration that we're working on uh, continuing to foster uh, between the UICC and the Timber Framers Guild and, um, and trying to combine sort of missions of both great organizations. Uh, and so this was, and this just occurred to me actually as you're, you're talking about your annual meeting. So uh, these folks arrived on Friday night. Uh, we started to work on Saturday. I think I came to your annual meeting on Sunday and I remember being ridiculously humid on Sunday. Um, go to the next slide. 
And then, of course, we know what happened on Monday. Um, so your annual meeting was a day, it was like the day of the flood, day before the floods. Um, so we had 12 people, some of them were from Vermont, but most of them had come from other places. Um, kind of welcome to Vermont. Uh, you're, you're stuck in <laughs> Richmond now. Um, yeah, so you can see this is actually where the river is. You can just barely see Crockett Road right there. Uh, Chris and Cubs little like, riding rink is right there. The, um, the horse farm is right there. Um, and this is all cornfield. So the road route two is closed right here. Um, so myself and Brad can both live in Huntington. You know, we can drive all the way up here to Jericho, all the way around, back down into the center of Richmond. Uh, so 45 minutes to get five minutes. But hard to, hard to complain considering what other folks went through too. Um, so. Um, and thankfully for our workshop, it didn't really affect much. This is actually a nice view of our campus. Yeah. 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 And it just goes to, I mean, I'm speaking, preaching on the choir here, uh, you know, it goes to show uh, just how well uh, old, older folks knew how to, how to place and locate uh, buildings and, and development and everything. I mean, it's just like, it's so high and dry right there, right? You've got so much more space. It didn't do anything. Yeah, we had a where we had some open excavations. There was yeah, I mean, there's a lot of water that comes down the hillside there. So some springs opened up, and there was a little bit of kind of washout, but I mean nothing really. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is a little bit more from the workshop. This is uh, Kelly, who actually came after the workshop to work for BYCC for a couple months is actually now working uh, for uh, Jeff Spencer, Stewardship Slate, who is going to be our lead slate uh, contractor uh, for this coming year for the work on the barn. Um, but you can see a little bit of what we were doing. That's a halved and bladed scarf joint on the left. Um, it's a half lap, basically, right? That's where the half comes from, and it is bladed. Those where the two little cogs are. Um, and it's a really, a really great way to sort of artistically, um, you know, repair a you know really you know solid structural way uh old and, and new wood and combining the two in, in matching species size uh, all that great stuff and a little bit more insulation so this is the kind of final days most of it was really working on repairs um but then thursday we started to get into a little bit friday was the last day uh, of doing this install, which is really fun for people to, to actually get to be fitting up some of the stuff that they've been working on cutting. And then as soon as timber framers were out, uh, we brought our excavators back in. So it, when the timber framers guild was there, we still had all of, except for those two trenches, we still had all of the rest of the concrete in the basement. So as soon as timber framers left, we got our excavators back, got rid of the rest of the concrete. And so this is the lowest slab here. Uh, it's really cool odd ripples down the whole length of the barn. Uh, must have been in how they were screening it. I don't know what the, the original sort of tools for that would be. Um, but you've got these granite blocks that are in between. Uh, the original timber posts sat in those granite blocks. And the whole floor sloped from the back of the building to the front, like 22 inches. Um, so again, everything would run, run downhill. It'd be easier to drag those sleds out. Uh, and they would come in, uh, sorry, you'd come in right here. There's a side door and you just keep making circles. One of the cooler, definitely the coolest uh, discovery we made uh, during the project was this amazing granite threshold. Uh, we had discovered, so where this side door was that I was just pointing to a second ago, we had found uh, a granite threshold there. Uh, we knew that this was the front door. I had kind of uh, realized this in grad school and I, I put in this piece of wood up here to identify that as the front door. Um, it hadn't been uh, the entrance for a long time, um, but it was, it was obvious from some siding details that it had been originally. Uh, but yeah, I came in on a, on a Monday. Uh, our excavators had worked on, on the Saturday before, and he said, well, you know, ran into this thing on, on Saturday, and you weren't here, so I didn't know what to do. He's, he's joking around, uh, and he points over the things. Hand split granite, uh, 14 feet long, two feet wide, and 14 inches thick. Uh, and it has all the original, all the, all the holes uh, that were, you know, hand drilled with a little, a little star bit and then wedged and feathered to, to split it um, all down the length of it. And so we're able to uh, set the foundation so that it's actually reincorporated back in the original location. Um, we'll have some pictures of that in a second. Uh, so as part of the moving of the front wall to, to plumb the building up, um, 
we had to pour a new concrete frost wall along the front of it. You'll see some pictures of that. Uh, and again, you can see on the left, this is what things looked like before. Uh, that had been the entrance right there. And then there was a, a patch of concrete in the middle where the original entrance had been, and, and the, the fire front looked like this. So really, the corners were the only original stone on the, on the front facade. So we went through, labeled them, uh, took photos, labeled all the stones, put each uh, layer of stones on the pallets. Um, and so each one is sort of identified with uh, Sharpie on top. Um, and then poured the new concrete frost wall and then worked with the stonemasons to relay all the stones at the same elevation. Because of course the top of the wall is critical um, because you gotta get the top elevation right. And so starting in the right place down low to end up in the right place up top. Um, and it, it turned out awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so here are all the pallets on the right. You can see this is like Southeast three, uh, different you know, photos and stuff as far as orientation. Um, and it was a bit of prep work doing this documentation, but it really made for such an easy rebuild. Uh, another slide after that. So this is the frost wall getting excavated. This is our wonderful lead excavator, Bill Atwood here from Bolton. His uh, grandfather was actually born in the White Farmhouse. Um, he was a farmhand uh, for the Wickham family. Uh, yeah, so again, I mean, there's just, the, I've skipped over 10 other sort of connections that various people have had to this project. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, yeah. So there's some new concrete going in, uh, just a really robust front wall, um, just because of the, the weight. Um, of this you know, monster structure here. Uh, and because we're also putting, we're, we're laying stones back on top. So we want a really wide base to set those stones on. So the concrete just goes up to grade and then it's stone above that. So you never see this concrete. Um, and as part of the removing all the slab on the inside, um, it meant that uh, on the outside of the building, your grade is up higher than your floor is. So in order to compensate for that, and to make a more robust sort of retaining wall out of the stonework, uh, we poured concrete on the inside. So you can see this is all the formwork for a one-sided wall, uh, just a lot, a lot of wood to make sure that it doesn't explode as you're pouring it. Um, this is probably one of our, our busier uh, concrete pouring days in uh, my history of doing barns at least. Uh, it's the first time I think I've ever had two mixer trucks pouring at the same time. So one is, <laughs> One's filling the pumper truck here, so they pour it into the pumper truck, and then the other one's pouring straight into the forms on the front side. So both things are happening. The, the picture you just saw down the length of the barn is happening on the inside. Um, that front wall is happening simultaneously. And here's our stonemasons. So pyramid stoneworks uh, out of stove. They were our, uh, our, our stonemasons. Um, just did a, a wonderful job. Um, so again, all this this front wall, you know, the corners were original still, uh, but all the rest of the stonework had been removed as they kind of patched in different areas with concrete over time. So they were working on both coming up with enough stone that was on site, uh, either through different piles that we had around or really like looking to find piles of stone uh, and then trying to put it together in a way that was authentic to the original stonework. Um, and they really did a great job. You can see the granite threshold there. Yep. On the interior, um, the, the posts had been just round uh, metal posts. Originally, they had been timber. Um, you can see the top left picture. You can actually see the grain uh, imprint. So this is uh, upside down. The post would have, you know, uh, this would have sat on the post. So this is you know, right here. Uh, you can actually see the grain of the post as it, it pressed into that piece, it actually stamped into that piece. Um, and so we cut out all that and we, we patched in new pieces of white oak so it's much more uh, dense and durable and less likely to crush. Um, and then have replaced all the posts with uh, tube steel, square steel. Um, again, on the left here, everything's hanging, everything's elevated and it's hanging from above. And so we had to put in all these posts, everything from below and also hang them but hang them plumb so that as the building lowered down, they were in the right place because you can't then pick the building back up just to crack the posts. Uh, <laughs> so this is all holding it in place, but it's floating there still. It's two inches off the ground. Uh, and so here you can see everything's floating. Uh, everything's hanging those two inches off the ground. Um, we've got this, the sills hanging on the come alongs. Um, this corner has been rebuilt here. This is that side entrance where the uh, manure suds would come in. 
you go out and around, uh, you can see the new concrete. Just want to yeah. you can see this because it's, it's almost uh, get lost. You see how this sill is two inches above the stones there? Mm -hmm. and that's the point that I know is. Yeah. Yeah, and again, yeah, everything is here. So these posts are hanging out, so those are hanging off of the straps are up there. This beam is hanging out with another trucker strap that's hanging out with the steel. Um, but yeah, this one left and gives you a good sense of everything from here down is, is hanging uh, off of the trucker straps. And um, yeah, really good. What could go wrong? Yeah, and so yeah, here's the granite threshold. Um, and you can see how well the kind of corners, you know into the new stonework that they've built there. Um, yeah, and the, and the front engine's redone. Uh, myself, so myself, I'm, I'm working as the project manager. Uh, Dan Lee, who we saw, is, is the site supervisor, the project supervisor. Um, and so we've been, you know, spearheading this thing the whole time. Uh, didn't really get to do any of the timber framing, which is, of course, what we love to do. Um, so the only little bit that we've gotten to do uh, we're repairing these, these posts. Uh, but then again, it's that really cool halved and bladed scarf joint. Uh, so I got to cut this one on the right, Dan got to cut the one on the left. Uh, and those are going to be up where the offices are too, and so they'll be, they'll be visible forever. Uh, really fun. Exactly. We haven't yet, but we will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is with the building set down in the top left there. Um, that was September. One of the things uh, that kind of glossed over a little bit, we had three months to have the building up in the air. Um, so Lou provided his steel and cribbing for three months and we had to do all the timber replacement, foundation repair and everything and have the building ready to set back down or he was going to charge us $500 a day um, that we weren't ready for him. So um, September uh, 24th, I think it was, was our was our, our day. We had to be ready and, and we were. Um, and, I mean, it was pretty anticlimactic going up in the air. Uh, I think it was a little over a month putting all of those steel I-beams in, building all the cribbing towers. Uh, and they, it was a Tuesday, they were gonna jack the building up and I had to go pick up a kid. And I was like, oh geez, I'm gonna miss this thing. But it literally in the course of about 15 minutes, the building went up in the air, the six inches or whatever that they initially need to leave it, uh, lift it. Um, so it was, you know, a month, month and a half worth of doing all this stuff. Uh, and then lowering the building was even more anticlimactic because they've got to go up with it. So they've got the, the gas engine running. And so you know that the building's going up a little bit to take the things that are holding it out so you can lower it down. But then when they lower it down, the engines are off and really all it is is cracking a valve and releasing that hydraulic pressure. So you're ready for it and then slowly like, Shh, and you're done. And, and the only reason it would be a climactic, of course, is if something goes wrong and breaks. And, you know, so uh, it was quiet and peaceful. And um, uh, yeah, so you see, we put the framing back together in the middle, um, resheathed here. Eventually, we'll end up resheathing the whole east side. It just takes a lot of weather right there. Um, but we've just really tried to work on this lower box this year. Um, all of the new wood that you see there is all from this, the Prelco land, the neighbor, um, and all of that stuff that you see there was milled on site, which is really cool. Right, forget I have these two. Right, uh, should I cruise through these? Long presentation. Uh, so the culprit of all of this uh, movement and everything is the hillside behind it. Um, and so in order to try to isolate the, the pressure from the hillside behind it and uh, make it so that it isn't pushing on that stone wall, we uh, had to create what's called a gravity uh, retaining wall. Um, so you can see Bob Neal's drawing on the left there. Uh, and it's this giant mass of what's called flowable fill. So it's a really weak concrete. Um, it's concrete with a bunch of air added to it. Um, and sometimes we'll use uh, other additives like uh, fly ash, um, but it's uh, just a giant mass. But if you poured it into like a six or eight inch wall, like you would with regular concrete, you could probably break it with your hands. It's so weak. Um, but basically the idea is that it's this large mass. It's, it's heavier on the back side and up higher. So if there's ever any, you know, pressure against it, it's actually rotating back away from the direction that it's been pushing it. Um, so it sort of neutralizes it. So there's never any horizontal pressure on the, on the stone wall. Um, so you can see here we've excavated all the way down 
Bill's made a road so we can get down in there. Uh, the stone mason's parched uh, this, so all the, all the mortar joints are just filled in really roughly just with concrete uh, cement just to seal them all up. Um, go to the next one. Uh, so you see a little bit more of that on the left uh, just to get everything sealed up so we aren't getting things moving through there. Uh, spray foamed it um, all the way down to the, the footing there. Um, next slide. And so this is a concrete slab that's poured across the bottom um, just to seal everything up. There's, you can see, I'll talk about it a little bit in a second here, but all this other material around uh, is all crushed concrete. Um, so that's worth paying attention to the road base, a bunch of this stuff. Uh, next photo. So yeah, all this stuff right here is crushed concrete. Um, but so this is the flowable fill. Um, it's super liquidy. Uh, so we would take, that uh, says right there, yeah, we had five trucks one day. Uh, so it, we had to work with the concrete company to figure out how much volume we needed uh, for each pour. So every time we were pouring two feet, but the higher up we went, the more it was because of the slope. Um, so one day there were five trucks, but then by the end of it, it was 11 trucks. Uh, and so we just have trucks coming in from both sides. Sometimes we'd have chutes, sometimes we'd have no chutes. It, it would flow all the way across, but sometimes it would kind of stop in the middle. Um, it would take about a day, a full day to harden. Uh, so then every other day we would do a pour and eventually um, fill the whole way up. Um, yeah, so uh, mentioned a little bit about the crushed concrete. Um, so concrete has the largest uh, carbon footprint of any building material out there by far uh, accounts for uh, roughly 8% of the world's CO emissions, mind blowing, uh, and everybody uses it all the time. We used a bunch of it. Uh, and in order to try to feel a little bit better about that and to offset our usage of it in knowing that we had to pull out a bunch of old concrete, um, we actually brought it down to uh, McCullough Crushing down in Berlin and they have a big jaw crusher. And so they, they crushed it into little three inch chunks uh, and then we got it back. So we had to pay for trucking to and from, but then we were able to reuse all of that concrete um, that was part of the barn forever uh, back in the barn. And so you can see this whole material here that filled it up to the piers and all that stuff that you saw on the outside of the building is all crushed concrete. Um, and we've still got probably two or 300 yards of it that um, the OICC can use for roads, uh, for other future projects. <laughs> yeah, everybody has to take a little bucket. Um, yeah, other building material choice, we, we were still kind of in the beginning processes and basically going to try to make these sort of choices whenever we can as far as building materials. Um, to use this product called Glavel, which is a relatively new product. It's a, a, a glass a foam aggregate. And so they pulverize uh, recycled glass. They add a foaming agent and they expands and they cook it and it goes across this uh, conveyor belt and it cools off. And as it cools off, it just breaks into little tiny pieces that are just these perfect little chunks. Um, they're then insulating uh, and they're, they're solid. So you can drive over with a piece of equipment. Um, and so it works as a, as a base layer. Um, you tamp it and everything to then be able to pour concrete on top of. Um, so we had to insulate over the top of those piers and the initial call was to do four inches of, of foam, of rigid foam, the blue board that you see, um, which is petroleum based. Uh, and for not a whole lot more money, we were able to use gravel and the gravel, instead of being just four inches of foam, this is actually 12 inches and it's the entire space. Um, so we basically saved money using the gravel, got the same insulation value that we needed and it's a recycled product. And there you go. Um, yeah, we're working on the, I don't have any great inside photos right now, but we've uh, put channel seal on the inside, of the, all these beams on the inside, we're putting the floor joist back in, in that, the floor that was removed. Um, so we'll get about three bays, uh, the floor put back in um, in the next week or so, and then kind of put things to bed. For this year, uh, start back up again in Mar March or April, work our way up through the building, and then in the summer, we're gonna open up the roof, a bunch of framing repairs that have to happen in the roof. And, uh, and then kind of work to turn it over to Breck and crew for uh, fitting it up for offices. Wow. There you go, yeah. It was a lot of talking stuff. Yeah. How did you get those lights up? 
we had a lift. Yeah, <laughs> big, uh, big personnel lift. You actually had to, yeah, we had a, uh, we have a 60 foot lift that's there normally, and we rented an 80 foot lift, uh, and then drove it over to do the West Barn as well. So both barns have yeah, holiday lights really uh, nice. around us. Yes. Um, yeah. I think that was, was that your idea? Yeah, Brett's idea. Um, yeah, really nice. I have a question. Um, you have some money that you spent on the Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the flowable fill. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, I don't have any that I can pull up and show easily. Um, tons of video. Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, I think documentary. Yes, I, I would love to. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody's got any connections to anybody, yeah, Vermont Public or any, um, there they had done. I don't know if anybody saw um, twenty years ago, um, Vermont Public Television. I guess at that point was uh, they did a movie called uh, Barnes: A Legacy of Stone and Wood. Um, and Jan was featured in it. I think at that point they were doing the West Barn. Um, so trying to like, that'd be a really neat thing to do again at some point to have Vermont Public do a, you know, a, a renewed version of that. So yeah, but we have lots of videos. Uh, we've, uh, I've got a drone and so we've been doing lots of drone flying with it and taking videos with the drone. Um, yeah, trying to document lots and lots of stuff. What about this old house? I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you'd submit it to this old house, that'd be perfect. Yeah. yeah. Were both barns owned by the same family? Yes, yeah. So that's a great, uh, great question. So the Whitcomb family, uh, one of the original builders, um, the East Barn was the original barn. So that was one that was built by Charles Miller in 1901. Uh, the son, um, Uziel, was the father, and Moses was the son. Uh, Wickham's. Um, so the son built the West Barn in 1904. We're not really sure uh, how how that was built. Who designed it? My my personal guess is that they hired Charles Miller to build East Barn. He knew what he was doing. Uh, they may have still hired a qualified timber framer to do the West Barn, but it was the, the West Barn isn't as highly engineered. Uh, the material materials weren't as high quality. Um, so the son was kind of trying to build the same thing as the father, but maybe not with exactly the same level. So that's why the west one was done before the east, because it was threatened more. Threatened yeah, the west the barn had an inferior slate on the roof was probably its biggest um, material sort of defect. Um, so it had a Pennsylvania black slate that was on it, uh, whereas the east barn has a un unweathering, unfading uh, gray, um, which is a much stronger slate. And so the slate on the west barn um, we have a photo, an aerial photo from the late 50s, I think, and you can already start to see huge patches of new slate in the, you know, 50 years later. Um, and then by the 80s, uh, it was in really bad shape. Uh, Jan uh, dismantled it with this guy, Mike Catronio, uh, and the two of them say it's like the scariest thing that they ever, um, they ever touched, uh, the dismantle of the West Barn um, at that point, um, which is mind-blowing considering the condition that the East Barn is in. Well, you had a lot to contend with this summer because they were construct. There was a lot of construction <laughs> on Route Two, and it was yeah. <laughs> and then the floods. I mean, it was quite a summer, a and lot. I drive that portion of Route Two fairly frequently. And um, yeah, there was a lot going on down in that neighborhood. So you did a great job overcoming a lot of um, problems. Yeah. Yeah, they, they replaced uh, Route 2 this year. I don't know if you saw that, but they uh, did the whole road base and everything. So they're going to pull those and actually like, digging down two, three feet and then replacing all the road base. And so the whatever four mile stretch took all summer. Uh, a lot of it in front of the barn. Wow. Yeah. One in the back. When was the last time there was an area that was great. Uh, the 80s, the late 80s. Uh, it was called the Venture Farm at that point. It was a guy named Zen Wheeler, Zenafan Wheeler, who was the one that left it to the Farm Bureau. Um, and I think at that point, though, they had a series of just unsuccessful um, goes at, at things, and they would just have sort of uh, farmers leasing it for a couple of years and uh, not able to make a go of it. And like, will you tell the story of um, the flood of, I think it was 76? Oh, yeah. And the, the way it was flooded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, did you have one other question? No, I'm wondering what the Farm Bureau had. Did they have any long term plans for or were they like, you just got this and they were looking for 
costs. Yeah, I think they um, they got a little bit of rental income from it, from the, the farmhouse. There were a couple of apartments in there. They were given the, the property, and I think they just, um, it was a large burden for them, really, ultimately. Um, Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We've we've worked on a number of large barns around. Um, worked on a huge one up in Craftsbury, Wolcott, um, and it's really hard to come up with new uses uh, with uses for for large old dairy barns. Um, the, the couple that we've done, they're wedding barns and. Uh, there's a lot of wedding barns. I know. I'm sure we need more wedding barns. Sure, but uh, it's really hard to figure out other uses. And aside from you know, organization like like VYCZ stepping in and saying like we've got a need for this restored barn. Hey, we've got a need a need for two restored giant barns. Like, uh, it, I mean, it really I've said it a couple of times. It's it's really a privilege to be in this time and space where like I feel like personally I've got the skills to do this stuff. The barn has the need. And we've got this organization that has the need and the ability to take this on. And it's just such an honor and privilege to be the folks that are able to be here doing this stuff. And it just couldn't be a more perfect combination of all those things. Um, so the uh, Brett was talking about this um, this flood, uh, one of the really neat moments we had. So um, Bill Atwood is our, our excavator there. I mentioned his grandfather was born in the farmhouse. He lives just down the road, right under the two. And he said, oh, I got this guy, Rod Wheelock, who, who worked in the barn. He'd love to come by and tell some stories. Um, so this guy, Rod, shows up. He's probably in his early 80s. And he steps out of the truck and says, oh, I recognize Rod. He used to work at Richmond Home Supply. Um, so he comes over and sits down. And he's just got, he worked there for 10 years in the 70s and 80s. Um, and just so many great stories. Uh, we'd found a couple of cow tags, the little um, tags all the cows wear. And we had, I think, 140 and 102. And I said, hey, Rod comes over. I said, Rod, do you, do you like collecting stuff? He's like, well, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brought over 140. He said, 140, she was the sweetest girl. <laughs> you could put your arm around her and she would nuzzle right in. And so what about 102? Oh, she was mean. She would kick. And, um, so he gave him 140. I said, Rod, you should, you should have this. This is amazing. Um, but that, uh, yeah. That uh, the high drive ramp, uh, that, that one photo I showed you at the beginning, is the only photo that we have of the high drive ramp. We don't know when it when it disappeared, if somebody came in with an excavator. There was a pile, of, a pile of stones out back there from that ramp, but that's the only thing that we have. Um, and he said it was the flood of 76. It was a big, uh, it was a springtime, uh, heavy uh, rain, a lot of snow melt runoff, and that hillside behind the barn just washed out, and it actually blew out the abutment. Uh, but at that point, they had tractors, so they weren't using the, the hay mow, the high drive in the same way. But what they would do in the wintertime is they would park all their tractor implements up in the high drive um, because they could drive their tractor right up there, drop an Im implement, go back for another one. So they lost the abutment. So they, they had to drag all their equipment to that front door. They had a crane come, and they had to swing all their implements out of the high drive with a crane. Um, yeah. Just made so seventy six is when it was when it was taken out and um, yeah endless stories. Was there any evidence of damage from the flood of twenty seven on that barn? No, that not that we know of. No, I'm guessing it probably didn't. I mean, the, considering what we saw this year, um, and because this this year was slightly higher, right? I think the Winooski level was I think it was like an inch or two higher than twenty seven. Could be wrong, but no, the, no evidence. question was going back to BYCC programs, how do the healthcare shares get to uh, all the different families who receive uh, the weekly shares? Um, so it takes a fair amount of logistics and coordination, but I think we have 14 medical centers, partner uh, hospitals, clinics who help us identify uh, healthcare share members. And then every week we'll have vans that go out and um, drop them off at those clinics, and then the families go to the clinics where they pick them up there. And I'm just 
cut. <laughs> skipping ahead or I'm imagining what your question is. Uh, our applications for a lot of different positions are just starting to go live. Uh, our programs really start in March and go through into November. Um, and we'll have one month to year round positions. Um, so, and some are residential, uh, meaning you can camp with us and some are day crews where you can um, go and work on the crew and then go home at night. So depending on how old you are and how much of um, how big a bite of the apple you want, there's probably a position for you. There's nothing for just the summer. There is. Oh, it is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I have a question for you regarding your relationship with resource. Yeah. How people from resource integrated with the BYCC? Yeah, more and more is what I would say. Um, when we first started working more closely with resource, it felt a little bit like parallel play which is a child developmental term. When you're about two and a half years old, you play like next to another person rather than with that other person. Um, but now we're really developing ways in which our crews can work together. So Resource is doing a lot of great flood recovery work down in Barrie, and they're gonna be working to repair a lot of homes. Um, and, and our crews will be coming in and out of that effort. Um, we're also seeing youth build members um, which, is a, which is a resource program, start to be uh, applying for and working on some of our crews. And so we're, we're trying to build um, ways in which we can run programs concurrently, but also, also pathways through our organization. So if you have an experience, say, at Youth Build, you can then come and work and learn on a BYCC crew. Or if you have a really good experience working on a VYCC forestry crew, maybe you then go on to Audubon and you're part one of their interns. And so building this whole ecosystem of both service, conservation, and learning. Uh, there, there's a great quote, um, a Dan Smith of the Community Foundation once said there, he said, Vermont is program rich, but systems poor. And so by bringing our organizations together, we're really trying to build a system of workforce development that's accessible. Oh, for sure. And yeah. Learn new things. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. So I have a question. I was astonished to hear the number of these uh, nationwide. Yeah. One hundred thirty. One hundred fifty. Yep. One hundred fifty. Yep. Which would give what three a state, right? Yeah. So so uh, on average, sure. Uh, some are really big. They're, so you have the Northwest Youth Corps. Uh, which operates out of Washington, Oregon, Idaho. Um, but you'll have multiple cores in California. So you have Los Angeles, Cali Los Angeles Conservation Corps. You'll also have a California Conservation Corps. You have cores um, affiliated with, with universities and colleges. Some are county-based. Um, and Vermont has two. There's BYCC as well as Northwood Stewardship Center. Um, and... Um, one of the, it's, for me, it's been a great discovery of my adult life is to just kind of get a, a window into this service ecosystem here in the country. It just represents not just the best of the United States, but all of us. It's really something to see. So are any of these as successful as you seem to have been? Um, I mean, yeah, yes. <laughs> I, I'm tempted to, be, tempted to be like falsely modest there. No, but they're, the courts are doing great work. Um, and, uh, you know, some are a little more innovative and entrepreneurial. I think BYCC tries to always be trying new different things. Um, but when I go to the core network conference, I'm just, I just marvel at the high quality of leadership and, uh, the way in which cores are really representative of, of the entire country. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Can we just come by and look at the barns? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and or you can give us a ring. Um, I'm on the website. Um, everyone should leave without taking uh, a, a gratitude report, aka annual report from BYCC. Get a quick 
uh, better look glimpse of the organization through that way. Um, but we'd, we'd love we'd love showing it off. And Elliot and I gave, I don't know, 20, 30 tours this summer. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you want to make sure there's somebody there, too. Feel free to reach out. We can give you a, you know, a, a guided tour or whatever as well. Yeah. Feel free to stop in for, yeah, self directed or uh, reach out. Well, thank you all for coming. I, I have one more question okay. for, for, for Elliot. You, you talked about concrete and uh, carving and uh, reusing uh, it. I, I've often read that. Making concrete and using it is so energy intensive and so on. But I've never really known why. Can you elaborate on why that that that's so important to, to reduce? Yeah, that's a great um, great question. I know part of the answer, and I, I, I will try not to um, yeah speak about things I don't actually know. But I, so it's it's the number of different things that are involved in the making of, of concrete. Um, so you've got the quarrying of cement, of you know getting the Portland cement, uh, and then it's, there's a cooking process and all of that. Um, and so I believe a large a large part of it is the electric, the electricity use in the um, in the heating process of the making of the cement. Um, but then a large part of it is also just the trucking of all the materials around. Um, but it's in the production of all of those things in the quarrying, and then the um, so the whole infrastructure around using concrete that, that creates the concrete. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the, the, yeah all the, the concrete, uh, the cement companies and everything, all the um, batch plants, I guess, that they're, it's getting made at. Tap on to that, does the preservation enthusiast, I like you last one about lovely old concrete. I've never heard that. <laughs> A shame we had to get rid of it because uh, there's no way to keep it but it was really kind of a shame it just had the, the ripley effect to it. it was just it was really cool i i mean i don't know when they were first doing large slabs like that um 1901 seems early um but it's just the, you saw those granite blocks there the slab was all around those and it would be hard to cons and so those those granite blocks all had to have stepped down with the slab that was all stepping down. So they were all at that same pitched elevation that the slab was at. So it'd be hard to conceptualize how you would do that and have a different floor in there and then pour a slab, but it's possible. Uh, I, try to, I try to be really cautious about making uh, assumptions on dates or anything like that. Um, I think a lot of people you know, claim to have the oldest house in town or whatever. So I try to really be reserved about um, making a claim that that is the original slab. Um, Any more questions? Uh, please join us for refreshments provided by our board member Judy. And uh, thank you again. That was so you great. Guys. Yeah, thank you all.